Hi, I'm talking to you today about feminist sociology and post-colonial sociology. The first I'm going to describe is feminist sociology. Feminist sociology emerged towards the end of the 20th century. Unlike other kinds of sociology that look at patterns of inequality right across the spectrum, a feminist sociology concentrates exclusively on patterns of inequality that have to do with power relations between men and women. So the central structure at the heart of a feminist sociology is patriarchy, first and foremost. Now, patriarchy is a system of authority where powerful males in any society have full authority, not only over women, but over men who are deemed less to have less authority within uh, that society at the time. I guess the thing to take keep in mind when we think about feminist sociology is it is designed to talk about relations between men and women or between women and men. And therefore, it looks exclusively at patterns that pertain to the experiences of women. This is perhaps best illustrated by um, one of the most well-known feminist sociologists who's still writing today, who is Sylvia Warby. And Sylvia Warby is a British sociologist. Now, she has suggested that there are six patriarchal structures which maintain unequal power relations between men and women and maintain male domination. The first of these is paid work. Now, I'm sure you're all very well aware that there is a discrepancy between male and female rates of pay and the kinds of positions that are held in Australia. Unfortunately, Australia has one of the worst records of any OECD country for unequal pay rates between men and women, even though women form a substantial part of the labour market. The reason for this is primarily that women are concerned with child rearing and domestic labour, which limits their participation in the labour market. They are not able to um, carry out the kinds of demands of mobility or life adjustment that are required of men as they move up the promotional ladder. One of the things that the statistics tell us that is that even when women are working full time, that men do not do an equal share of childcare or housework even today. And as I said previously, Australia has one of the worst international records among OECD countries, comparable OECD countries. Scandinavian countries and Canada are far better in their division of labour. The second thing is household production, where women feel that they have to take up the reins of household labour and um, production, and particularly childcare. And the other thing, of course, is the state, where the state does not really provide either adequate subsidised childcare, as many other countries do, or some of the leave provisions, which other countries do. The third factor that Sylvia Warby identifies is culture, and she draws um, specific attention to the mass media and the stereotypes of males and females that are generated through the mass media. We must these days add the phenomenon of social media, which tends to amplify the effects of the mass media. The next one is sexuality, where the sexuality of men is imagined primarily in hydraulic terms, that there is a kind of male sex drive which must find its way out regardless. And women, by contrast, are constructed as sexually passive. So there is a particular kind of understanding there where women basically learn to adjust their own sexual practices to the far greater, either real or imagined, sex drives of men. And also heteronormativity, such as described, particularly within the critical literature coming out of um, the queer um, theories, really tells us about heteronormativity and its effects upon the way that men and women choose to live their lives. The next one is violence and it has to be mentioned so therefore the greatest amount of violence is really carried out by men against women there is also violence by men against men which is also part of our understanding of patriarchy however very little of the actual violence that's ever carried out is carried out by women although they are notorious when they do do it partly because it is so unusual Women live with a particular th threat of violence, particularly sexual violence, which comes into the awareness of girls when they are quite young and as they enter the early teens, and that to some extent circumscribes their behaviour. 
Finally, Sylvia Walby talks about the impact of the state, the extent to which the state does or it doesn't support the structures of patriarchy. And we can find countries in the world where there is less support for patriarchal structures, where women are equally rewarded within the labour market or where there are, is free and abundant childcare available to women who want to balance their family life and their working life. Turning to the Australian sociologist, Raywin Connell, who's another very famous voice within feminist sociology. And Raywin Connell has been responsible for coining the famous terms hegemonic masculinity and what she calls subordinate femininity. Now, masculinity in Connell's framing is hegemonic because it forces consensus, which is Gramsci's original notion of hegemonic. It's hegemonic because it controls meaning. Femininity can never be hegemonic because it can't control the structures of meaning, because the structures of meaning are anchored to patriarchy, capitalism and the state. So Connell was unique in really proposing this idea of hegemonic masculinity, which hegemonic masculinity is kind of an interesting concept because no man can ever really live up to it. It is so all powerful. It is so hydraulic. It is so faultless in every way. It is the ideal of masculinity to which no little boy can really ever live up. So there's a whole problem within patriarchy of the fact that men, little boys and young men are confronted with ideals of masculinity, which they can rarely, if ever, hope to achieve. But turning once again to the subordination of women, Connell talked about the fact that within subordinate femininity, there are particular understandings of the way that women are supposed to be that really constrain the activities of girls. We might look, for example, at the fact that in New South Wales, although not so much in other states, girls are still forced to wear to primary school unfortunate, ugly school uniforms, little frocks, which are archaic, which are out of date and which limit their playground behaviour. I can't see it disappearing anytime soon, but it's an example of the fact that girls are subtly reminded of their roles within femininity. Thank you.